turn with me to Luke 23, verse 42. I'm going to read from verse 36. The soldiers also came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read this, Is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It's come to prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for the wondrous privilege of being able to gather together this morning. Lord, may you speak into our hearts. Lord, we bow our heads and our hearts before you. Please send your Holy Spirit very powerfully up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. May it touch each and every one of our hearts and each and every one of our lives. May you speak into all of our hearts, starting with my own. Glorify your name this morning for Jesus' sake. In God's people say, Amen. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on the cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the ground shook and quaked, darkness literally came over the entire land. And all while Jesus turned and raised his eyes towards heaven and cried out his last, as he hung from nails from his hands and nails from his feet, and a spear was later taken and thrust into his side, all as Jesus hung between heaven and earth, having suffered for you and I. And all this happened after the soldiers had gone and reached and taken him out of the prison, after having put a red robe over him, and then beaten him with a cat of nine tails, again and again, and mocked him, jeered at him, laughed at him to scorn, and then taken a crown of thorns, and pushed that crown of thorns into his head, and then taken a stick, a reed stick, and smacked him repeatedly, driving that thorns deep into his skull, so that blood issued from his face. And then they took that red robe that had now become glued to his back through serum and blood, and they ripped the robe off, causing greater bleeding, while Jesus turned and cried out and screamed in pain. And then they took two thieves that were going to be crucified with him. And they took them across Jerusalem, and Jesus, weakened by lack of food and lack of water and lack of sleep and lack of blood, fell. And they turned and they compelled a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene, a non-Jew, to carry his cross. And as long as there is history, that truth is a truth that will stand out, that a non-Jew helped carry the cross of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The Romans, the non-Jews, they beat Jesus repeatedly. They issued the death sentence. And the Jews, the Lord's own people, turned and mocked Him and scorned Him. In other words, Jesus came to die out of love for the sins of the world, Jew and non-Jew. And the whole world, Jew and non-Jew, were involved in the crucifixion. All are accountable for what happened to the Christ. And when they got to Golgotha, they reached and placed Jesus down on the ground and stretched out his arms. And they hammered the nails deep into his wrists. And then they took his feet together and smashed the nails into his feet. And the two thieves that were crucified with Jesus yelled and screamed and cried. And Jesus, <coughs> as he hung there, uttered not a word. And then the soldiers took some medicated wine and they gave it to the thieves to dull their pain and they drank it deeply. They took it. But Jesus did not. He refused it because he wanted to drink the very dregs of God the Father's wrath against every single one of us. He wanted to suffer all of death to show us that God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son to die for all those who would believe in Him and what He was doing upon that cross. And then the people that were standing there, watching Him, 
started to scorn and mock him, to ridicule him, and to deride him, saying, Luke 23, verse 35, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the Son of God, the Chosen One, let him come down from the cross. He worked miracles. You raised Lazarus from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? But those blind people didn't realize that God had gone and foreordained and predestined that Jesus Christ was to die upon that cross, bearing the punishment and bearing the sins for man. And that it would only be through that death that our world would find forgiveness, that our world would find salvation. In Acts 4 verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name unto heaven given to men by which we must be saved. <coughs> the Apostle Paul, who was one of the most and greatest intellectuals and most brilliant men of the ancient world, went and visited Corinth, a pagan, intellectual, immoral city, the center of the ancient world. And he turned and he said to them in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I have resolved... To know absolutely nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now why did Paul say that? Why did he say that? He said that because God had gone and locked up in the cross the secrets of the entire universe. Which says that the only way earth can ever find reconciliation with God their creator is by the way of the cross. The only way that you and I as individuals here and our friends and our family and the people we love and care for can come to heaven is through the cross. And if Jesus Christ had never gone to the cross, we, you and I, would never ever have our sins forgiven by God. You and I would never ever have the opportunity to go to heaven. And the problems of the earth in terms of a blessed eternity would never ever find a solution. Only by way of the cross can we find our way back to God, every single one of us this Good Friday. And that is why it is so important that Jesus Christ stayed and He hung there upon that cross. All because you see man is in continual rebellion against God. Adam and Eve turned and rebelled against God in the Garden of Eden. They didn't listen to what God said. They completely disobeyed the Lord. And ever since then, the genes of rebellion against God have been in every man, woman, and child. You don't have to teach a child to lie. You've got to teach them to stop lying. So that every minute of the day, we continually break the laws of God and sin against God, and we know it deep down in our own souls and hearts. And as a result of that, God and man are completely separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Man has broken the laws of God. He deserves death. He deserves punishment and judgment. But God said, wait a minute. You just wait a minute. I will give you my only son. My only son. I will let him die. I will let him take the punishment against human sin. I will let Jesus, my only son, take hell and judgment for your life. And if you turn and you put your faith in my son, believing in what he has gone and done, calling upon him to literally save you, I will turn and forgive your sins. And I will give you a deep inner joy and a peace and a heart satisfaction that you will never find any other way. And so Jesus hung there. Die on a cross for your sins, for your <coughs> sins, for my sins. <coughs> Some people turn around and say, why don't you make the gospel relevant? Why don't you make it more relevant? The most relevant message in the entire world today is that Jesus Christ died for you. He died in your place before God, for you and I individually. He shed His blood for us. And without that experience, no one, no one can ever get to heaven. Yes, as Jesus died, people laughed and they mocked and they scorned him to derision. 
And perhaps the greatest mockery of all came from two people hanging on crosses right on either side of him. Two thieves, violent men, robbers. They both mocked him. And then suddenly, one grew strangely silent. And then suddenly this one who grew silent turned and rebuked the other thief on the cross and corrected him. In Luke 23 verse 40, he said, don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus. And he asked him what seemed to be an absolutely improbable and impossible question. Luke 23, 42. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most outstanding answers in the history of the entire world. An answer that must have caused heaven to literally go absolutely silent. For in Luke 23, 43, Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. Think about it. There was a robber, there was a thief, perhaps even a murderer, a rough man, probably a violent man in his own life and heart, a drinker, a man who probably spent his life cursing and swearing. And in his dying moment as he hung there in Luke 23, 42, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He didn't say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, you know, when I was young, I used to do this in the synagogue, the church, and I used to do this in the temple. And you know, Lord, I always went to Sunday school. You didn't do that. He simply said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered as quick as a flash in Luke 23, 42. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today. And to all people who think you cannot be converted in a moment, and think that you cannot be saved in life, right now, listening to this message in this room, in this building, at this moment in time, you are mistaken. You are listening to this message because you felt the moving of the Holy Spirit in your heart this morning to come to this building under God's prompting because God's Spirit is working in you because you know in your heart that the Son of God died upon a cross for you today. Many people in the Old Testament, New Testament never planned to come to Jesus. They never planned that. They never thought that their lives would ever be changed before God. This thief, as he sat in the dungeon in the Roman fortress of Antonia, had been sitting there in prison with all the swearing and the cursing and everything that had gone on, and he knew he would die on the cross. He knew the appointment was coming up that day. He knew that he would fulfill Roman law and be punished for it. He deserved it. But deep down, he never dreamed that that day, that night, he would be standing before God and be welcomed into an eternal dwelling in heaven. He never dreamed that would happen to him. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But you know, I'm going to see that man one day. I'm going to walk the streets of heaven. And I'm going to see him walking towards me. We're going to sit down and we're going to talk. We're going to shake hands. And there he's going to be standing before me by the grace of God. He wasn't saved because of his good works. He didn't have any. He was a robber and he was a thief and perhaps even a, a, a murderer and a moral man. He didn't have time to be baptized. He didn't even do a Christianity Explored course. <laughs> but he will be in heaven with God. That is the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in the history of mankind is one word. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. In that Jesus went and forgave him instantly of every sin that that man had ever gone and committed in life. He wiped the stone clean. 
Here he was standing right there in heaven, welcomed into dwellings. There are three things about this passage that you find the whole gospel in it. And I want to share them with you as we close. Firstly, there is repentance. In fact, this is the only deathbed repentance scene you will find anywhere in the entire Bible. I don't know what was going through that particular man's mind when he turned and he asked Jesus this question. He must have known deep down about Jesus. He had heard talk out there in the streets about a man going around doing miracles and wonders and raising the dead and doing incredible miracles. He must have heard the crowds talking and saying, he's the son of David, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ of Israel, perhaps this is the son of God. He would have heard Jesus' prayer in Luke 23 verse 34. Where Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he must have touched them to see Jesus hanging there in absolute agony and the crowd scorning him and the crowds laughing at him and Jesus hanging there and praying for his people. And in all this, no doubt, his heart must have been touched by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But whatever happened in God's grace, the Holy Spirit moved him and prompted him to realize his deep down need for Jesus Christ. He needed forgiveness of sin. And he was saved. I can just imagine the other thief hanging there and looking at him with absolutely bitter angriness in his eyes, puffing and scorning and sullen. Turning around and looking at him and saying, what are you doing? Have you become all religious or something? Remember all the robberies you've got and done in your life. Remember how you went and attacked that merchant for his gold. Remember that person's life that you went and destroyed. Remember that person that you went and killed in that bar fight. Do you think that God's going to turn around and forgive you? Look at your life. Look at your life. Look at how you've gone and failed God in life. Look at what you've gone and done. Look at how you've lived. Your life. Your thoughts. God can never ever forgive you. God can't. But God did. God did. That's Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've gone and done in your life. It doesn't matter the sins that you've gone and committed. It doesn't matter what you've gone and how you fail God in your daily life. You might feel deep down that you're the worst person possible. God could never want you. You could never be a Christian. It doesn't matter what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can forgive you today if you put your faith and your trust in Him, <coughs> turning away from your sin. The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be what? Saved. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person if you in your heart put your faith and your trust in Him turning away from your sin. This man, in his own heart, turned to God. And in doing so, he turned away from his sin and he repented that Good Friday. The second thing he did is believe. He believed. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and what? Believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. The Scripture says that as many as believed in Him, He gave the power to become sons of God, as to many who believed in His name. Just repent. Repent. Turn away from your sin. Believe. And you will be saved. In John 3, 16 it says, For God so loved the world, that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever, what, believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. In Luke 23, 42 it says, Then He said, Jesus, remember me when you comest into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Right now, you will be saved because you believe in me and you repent of your sin. Right now, right now, you will be saved. Right now, you will have eternal life. And that day, he walked into heaven, paradise. 
And then thirdly, there is the word remember. Remember. I want you to think about that a moment, just, to, just for a moment. Remember. It said in Luke 23, 42, Jesus, remember me. Do you know that God forgets? Do you know that God forgets? Do you know that in Jeremiah 31, 34, the scripture says, <coughs> For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember, remember their sins no more. God can forget. God can forget all your sins. What did God not forget? Well, God doesn't forget the universe. He remembers the rain and He sends it on the godly and the ungodly. He remembers to send the light of the sun on the just and the unjust. All His blessings He remembers to send upon humanity. Suppose just for a moment that God forgot to send the rain and the light of the sun and to order the universe like He does. Just for a moment. Our world would spin out of control and become a dark and frozen glacier. But God doesn't forget. Scripture says God holds the entire universe together. Do you know that God doesn't forget you? But He remembers every single one of us individually every single day. Psalm 139 verse 1, great psalm, says, O Lord, You have searched me and You know me. You know when I arise and You know when I can perceive my thoughts from afar. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? The point is, there's nowhere that you can go to get away from God. He knows everything about you. God has created you. Look at verse 13. You created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. In fact, all the days of your life are in God's book. Verse 14, all the days ordained for me have been written in your book before one of those days ever came to be. How many times does God watch over you? All the time. All the time. You almost had a car accident this week and suddenly, just before the accident happened, something stopped it. Ever happened to you? It's happened to me. You nearly had a fatal illness, but God suddenly caught it in time. Why? Well, because of God's divine intervention, God remembers you. But in the same way, when you don't repent of your sin, God never forgets. God's word says, be sure your sins will find you out. In Matthew 10, 26, Jesus said, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, so shall he reap. The Bible says in Matthew 12, 2, 36, But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Every word. God's going to judge every unforgiven sin that has ever been done by you and I. That unforgiven sin that so easily gets you and I will be brought before God. For God never forgets an unrepentant sin. But He has instead recorded everything that we have ever done from the time that we were born to the time that we die. It's all there. It's all there. But there is one thing God does forget this Good Friday. And that's forgiven sin through Christ. Because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Isaiah 53, it says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And 1 Peter 2.24, it says of Jesus, he bore on his body our sins on the tree. The point is, this Good Friday, God is one who can turn to every single one of us and forgive us our sins. All of them. Every sin we've ever done in our entire lives. The slate is clean. The sin that would judge is gone. The sin that would condemn us is gone. God can forget. Forget. Wow. In Hebrews 1, 3 it says, your sins are purged. Isaiah 43, your sins are purged. In Hebrews, God remembers your sins no more. No more. Isn't that wonderful? That's Good Friday. Because Jesus died and He rose again. Amen? Amen. Because of what Jesus did for you on Good Friday. 
If you have turned and you've called upon Him in repentance, God can remember your sins no more. No longer. I wonder, has He forgiven you your sins? Have you brought your sin and literally laid it before the cross? The cross. What a day Good Friday is. A day to come to God and to literally give your life over to Christ. <coughs> if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, you may never have another opportunity like you do here this morning. You are here today because deep down in your heart, the Holy Spirit moved you and you know God's prompting that Jesus, the Son of God, came into this world and He died for you out of love. You know it in your heart. This is your moment. A holy moment. Call upon Jesus Christ today. Today. To be forgiven as your Savior today. Or perhaps you need to recommit your life to God for the rest of this year, today. There's not another day. Won't you do it today? Let's come to prayer. Perhaps you feel moved after the message to commit your life to Christ. Just speak to him for a moment. Perhaps you would like to pray a prayer like this. You can pray it quietly in your heart after me. If you feel it. Heavenly Father, I confess that I am a sinner. I know I have failed you many times in my life, each and every day. I have lived my life my way. I am sorry, and I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. I will seek to live a holy life for you. Thank you for sending Christ to die in my place. Please forgive me as you have promised. Please give me your gift of eternal life. I want to live for you from today on. Help me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Or perhaps you just want to recommit your life to Christ. Won't you do that? <coughs> God's people say in the name of Jesus, 